Hello and welcome to another NGen Math 6 lesson by eMath Instruction. My name is Kirk Weiler and today we're going to be doing Unit 12, Lesson 2 on Predicting Outcomes. Now this entire unit is about probability, right? Our ability to measure the likelihood or chance that something is going to happen. So what we're going to be doing today, right, we saw how to measure probability using these ratios. We're now going to be using those ratios to try to predict how many times a particular thing happens. All right, so let's jump into that right away. Here we go. Probability is used to measure the chance that something will happen, often using fractions, i.e. ratios. In fact, the probability represents the fraction of the total times that we expect a particular event to happen. So when I say something like, well, the probability that, um, you know, that I will pull a particular card out of the deck is one in five, right? That means one fifth of all the cards I pull out should fall into that category, right? So it's not just sort of a one in five, it's actually one fifth of the total outcomes should be the following. Now let's see how that plays out in our first exercise where we revisit something that we'll see a lot, which is rolling a die. Let's do it. Will rolls a standard six-sided die shown to the right where the rolls one, two, three, four, five, and six are equally likely outcomes. There's that phrase again, equally likely outcomes. Letter A. If Will rolls the die just once, what is the probability the number rolled will be greater than four? Write as an unreduced fraction. All right, well, this is simple enough. Remember, we've got six equally likely outcomes, six equally likely outcomes. We want to know the probability that the number that Will rolls will be greater than four, right? Greater than four. So, you know, we've got these six equally likely outcomes, right? And here are the ones that are greater than four, right? So there are two of these outcomes that are greater than four. So our probability is two sixths. That's it, right? Two out of six. Now letter B, easy peasy. Write your answer from A as a reduced fraction. All right, well this shouldn't take you very long. Pause the video for a moment and reduce that fraction. All right, easy enough. I could divide both numerator and denominator by two, and I get a reduced fraction of one-third. Now, I want you to really, really understand what that means. That means that if I roll this die a bunch of times, you know, however many times, I don't care, one-third of the times we would expect, or we would predict, one-third of the time for a number greater than four to be rolled. It's pretty much that simple. Now, by the way, eventually you're going to need a die, a single six-sided die, for this problem. So make sure to have one of those handy. I should have mentioned it right away, but make sure you've got one. All right. And let's take a look now at letter C. If Will rolls the die 24 times, how many of these would you predict had rolls greater than four? Explain your answer. All right. Well, why don't you pause the video now? and see what you get. How many times out of these 24 would we expect to get a number greater than four? Well, the idea, right, that we just found was one third of the time we should get a number greater than four. Well, that means that if we roll the die 24 times, right, and one third of the time we should get a number greater than four, then we should have eight times, right? Explain your answer. One third of the times rolled, we expect to get a number greater than than four, right? And that's exactly what that probability tells us, all right? One third of the time, we expect to get a number greater than four. Now, by the way, just notice just for a minute, right? If I took this eight and this 24, right? And I formed a ratio with them, eight 24ths, 
then to no great surprise, that ratio equals one-third, right? If I just simply reduced both the numerator and the denominator by a factor of eight, I would get back to my one-third. And that's another way to do it. Another way to actually do this problem is to just say, well, all right, I mean, now if I had a total of 24 on the bottom, what would be my numerator? Oh, it would be eight. But at the end of the day, I really want you to understand that the probability is the fraction of the total times we expect something to happen. And we know how to find the fraction of a total just by multiplying the total by that fraction. Now, you might say, well, we might not actually get eight numbers that are greater than four, right? Maybe, maybe we'd get less than that. Maybe all of them would be, maybe all 24, right? Not likely, but maybe. Um, so I'd like you to experiment a little bit with this. And it's a really easy experiment, right? Um, letter D, let's take a look. Take a standard six-sided die and roll it 24 times. Record your results on the, uh, in a dot plot on the number line below. Um, so you're going to do that, and then in letter E, how many times of the 24 rolls did you roll a number greater than 4? Circle these on your dot plot. All right, so this is going to actually take you a little bit, not too long, right? But I would suggest, you know, turning off the, or pausing the video now, taking that six-sided die, right, whether you're working for home or working in a classroom setting, just roll it 24 times if you're working with a partner. Maybe you can roll, the partner can record, or vice versa. All right, and just, you know, every time you get a one, put another little dot above one. Every time you get a two, another dot above two, et cetera. And then circle all of the rolls on your dot plot that where you got greater than a four. Pause the video now. All right, we do a lot of simulation work in math seven. All right, math six, very little, but a little bit right now. We'll do a little bit on our final day of probability. But as I always like to say, there's no way for me to know your results, right? They're kind of random. So I did this experiment myself. Whoop, that's not what I wanted to have happen. Let's try this again. Here we go. Still not. Man, all right, here we go. So I did this experiment myself, and I was just trying to move this out of the way. Chaos ensued. And here were my results, all right? Now, by the way, in a perfect world, we would actually expect this to be what's called a uniform distribution. In other words, we'd expect to have the same number of dots above each one of those numbers. But there's chance, right? Chance means that certain things happen more than other things, right? And if I look at my dot plot, at least, all the numbers that were greater than four are right there. And what did I have? I ended up rolling six of these things and three of these. All right, so I, I rolled six fives and I rolled three sixes. And letter F, and again, you'll have to answer this for yourself. Let's take a look. Are your results consistent with what you would expe expect based on C? Are they exact, close, or significantly different? Explain your choice. All right, so again, for you, right, you'll have to answer that for yourself, and we'll talk about it a little bit. Our prediction in C was that we should have had eight times when we rolled a number that was greater than four. I ended up having nine times. All right, so mine wasn't exact, right? And again, it would be, you could have it exact, you know, if you got exactly eight, awesome, then they were exactly the same. I would say close, I'm gonna put in parentheses for me, because we expected eight and got nine. Now, why would you say, well, you know, significantly different? Well, significantly different, we're expecting eight, maybe you got one, maybe you got only two, maybe you got none at all. That would be strange. It would also be strange if you got 16 or 17 out of the 24 were way up here, right? That would start to make you wonder if there was something wrong with the die that you were using, okay? But if you got in the realm of seven, you know, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, that's all reasonable, okay? Outside of that, it starts to be different enough that you might wonder what's going on with the die. Let's keep going. All right. Now, when all outcomes are equally likely, we call this a uniform distribution, a uniform probability distribution. All the numbers on the dice are equally, or on the dice, are equally likely to be rolled, okay? 
A great example that comes up a lot in probability is tossing a coin. So let's take a look at that in exercise number two. When you toss a coin, there are two outcomes, heads, H, and tails, T. Letter A. If a coin is tossed once, what is the probability it lands on tails? All right, this should be pretty easy. Why don't you pause the video and see what you get? Well, there are a total of two equally likely outcomes, H and T, right? The probability will land on tails, well, that, that counts as one of them, and therefore the probability is one half. It might be the most probability, most common probability in all probability problems, right? What is the probability when you flip a coin, it lands on either heads or tails? Well, on either one of them, it's gonna be one half. Now, letter B, pretty easy, let's take a look at that. If a coin is tossed 30 times, how many tails would you expect? All right, well, pause the video. How many tails would you expect? Well, let me emphasize again. This one half not only is measuring chance, but it's also saying we expect half of all outcomes to fall into this category. This category being getting a tail. So if I flip a coin 30 times, then I expect to get one half times 30 or 15 tails. That's what I expect. Now, will I get 15 tails? Actually, it's kind of unlikely that I'll get exactly 15, but that's what I expect to get based on the fact that half of all outcomes should be a tail, probability-wise. So let's look at a follow-up question, exercise number three. Elena buys a coin at Dave's Magic Shop and flips it 30 times. It lands on heads 28 times. What does this tell you about the coin? Well, pause the video and think about that for a minute, especially in light of the answer we just got here. Well, in all likelihood, it is not a fair coin, all right? So, I'll put that in quotes. It's not a fair coin and is more likely to land on heads than tails. So often in probability problems, you'll see wording like somebody rolls a fair die or somebody flips a fair coin. And they throw in the word fair to tell you that, hey, the probability of getting a head is the same as the probability of getting a tail. Or in the case of a die, the probability of getting a one, two, three, four, five, six are all equally likely. But there are what are called loaded coins and loaded die. Okay, and those literally are sort of trick coins and trick die that will land more often on one thing than they do on the others. And so if Elena buys this coin, right, and flips it 30 times, she's expecting to get 15 heads and 15 tails. Now, nothing will seem out of the ordinary if she gets 17 and 13 or 18 and 12, even anywhere in that realm. But all of a sudden, if out of 30 times that she flips it, 28 times it lands on heads, that's far too often right? That in all likelihood means that it's not a fair coin and that it's more likely to land on the head side than on the tail side. All right. Well, let's take a look at one more problem where we do some predicting of outcomes. Exercise number four. The board game spinner shown has 12 identical sections marked off. If the pointer is spun 36 times, answer the following questions. Letter A, how many times would you expect the pointer to land on an even number? Okay, well, again, let's go through letter A and then have you work on B and C on your own. So an even number, right? The first thing I wanna know is what fraction of all the outcomes are evens. Now, sometimes that'll be one half, sometimes it won't. In this case, it is one half because we've got 12 total, right? 12 total sections it could land on. And six of the 12, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, six of the 12 are evens. So the probability of getting an even is six twelfths, which is one half, right? So I can say, well, one half times 36 gives me 18 
evens, right? So the probability that it will land on an even is 6 out of 12, all right? But that's one half of all the total occurrences. So if I've got 36 times that I spin it, one half of those times I would expect an even, one half times 36 gives me 18 evens. Let's take a look at letter B. How many times would you expect the pointer to land on a number less than four? All right, well, why don't you go ahead and try to figure that out? Well, how many of these numbers are less than four? That's easy enough, right? The number's one, two, three. So the probability that we would get a number less than four would be three twelfths, which if I reduce would be one fourth. Now that tells me that one fourth of all my spins, I expect to get a number less than four. So if I do now one fourth times 36, I'll get nine, right? So nine times I expect to get a number that is less than four. Let's do one more. Letter C, how many times would you expect the pointer to land on a prime number? All right, well, I'm going to see if you can figure this one out. We reviewed what, were, what, what a prime number was in the last lesson. See if you can figure out how many times I would expect the pointer to land on a prime number. All right, well, let me circle the primes, right? Prime numbers are any number larger than one that are only divisible by themselves and the number one. So there are five of those, two, three, five, seven, and 11 are all prime numbers. So the probability, we can't even reduce this one, the probability that I will land on a prime number is 5 twelfths. That also is the fraction of the number of times, the fraction of the number of times that I expect to get a prime. So I'm gonna multiply that by the total number, right? If you really wanna see that over one, you could do that. 12 will go into 36 three times, and we'll expect a prime number 15 out of those 36 times. Okay, that's absolutely it. So let's wrap this up. Probability really can be thought of in two very similar and complementary ways. One way is it simply a measurement of how likely something is to happen. So five out of eight times, seven out of 12 times, whatever. But it can also be thought of as the fraction of the total number of times we do something where a particular outcome arises. And that last exercise was a really good example of it, right? So I, I spin that thing 36 times. There's five twelfths, five twelfths of the time, right? A fraction of five twelfths indicates how many times I'm going to get a prime number. So five twelfths times 36 gives me 15 times I expect to have a prime number. So you can use probabilities and how many total times we do something to calculate how many times we expect to have something to happen. Now, if our expectations don't meet reality, right? Think about that coin problem where the person bought the coin from the magic shop. Then that probably tells us that there's something wrong with our probability model, right? Something is off. Our probability isn't correct in that case. And that's kind of an important consideration because sometimes you think you have one probability where you really have another one. All right. Well, we're going to obviously be working with more probability in this unit. For now, I just want to thank you for joining me for another NGen Math 6 lesson by eMath Instruction. My name is Kirk Weiler, and until next time, keep thinking and keep solving problems.